So we have our second uh, speaker, Sandeep Dutta. He is uh, uh, from US and he has uh, adjusted his calendar to be here today. So thank you, Mr. Dutta. So he is the founder of System View and uh, he is a designer of high efficiency microprocessors. So uh, uh, Mr. Dutta today is going to present us Visual System Integrator, a tool that uh, enables really complicated uh, development on really complicated hardware. Please welcome. Thank you, Varam, for the introduction, and good morning, everybody. OK, so just an introduction about ourselves. Um, we are based in California. We are partners of Xilinx. They are actually our investors as well. Uh, development, developing tools for Xilinx FPGAs, mostly uh, processors and AI engines. And we'll keep going into these uh, concept of AI engines. Um, it is actually one of the uh, AMD or Xilinx's uh, key products at this point where they have, in addition to an ARM processor and an FPGA on the chip, they have 400 uh, small microprocessors, um, which are vector processors, really, um, on a network on chip inside, uh, integrated into that chip. So one of the big things that uh, the users are uh, looking at for our tool is to be able to provide a design or a programming environment for these complex, on the complex systems, right? Um, as the previous um, speaker, you know, alluded to, uh, systems are becoming increasingly complex, and the lack of system programmers is very apparent, right? And this is one of the big things that people face today in the system integration is when you have a design which actually spans across multiple chips, right? You can say, okay, this is a x86 and it's connected to an FPGA over PCIe. You can have an x86 and you have a GPU connected over PCIe. Um, and this is not just limited uh, as the you know, SOC uh, and system integration and hardware integration increases. These are not just discrete items, right? They can be on the chip itself. So they are connected via on-chip networks, but different kinds of uh, components are being put together in very complex configurations. And uh, to be able to program them, it's becoming increasingly difficult. Um, so our tool is a visual, as it says, it's a visual system integrator. So we provide kind of a two-level uh, approach to uh, system programming. First, you describe the platform layer, which is the bottom part of it. You specify wh what are the components that are, are there in your system. Right? Do you have a processor? Do you have a FPGA? Do you have an AI engine? So you have a bunch of components, and they are connected via certain protocols, right? In this case, it could be PCIe, it could be AXI, it could be AXI streams, or in case of uh, FPGAs, it could be linked by Aurora. So what we do by specifying these connections and transport between these physical entities is that we abstract away the device driver part of the uh, transport of data between these components. Um, so when the users actually come to program these chips or these um, distributed systems, they are just looking at them as um, components on a canvas. So the platform layer, like I mentioned, expresses the connection and the transport between the components. Uh, CPU, be it CPU, be it an AI engine, be it a, a GPU. Then we have the application layer, and this is where mostly the users are doing the work. Um, so typically, um, the hardware designer or the hardware board guy will create this platform, and System View provides a certain set of uh, canned platforms as well. So the application programmer is actually going to be working at this level. So the way it works in our tool is that you actually bring in software blocks or hardware blocks and place them on the on corresponding to the component on your canvas. See, for example, if this was an x86 or an ARM, and if you place the component on that x86 or an ARM, we will assume that this will execute on a software context. Similarly, if you have an RTL block and you want to place it on the FPGA, 
then we will assume that it will execute on the FPGA. Um, so what are these arrows? These arrows actually depict the flow of data between these two blocks. So when the data actually flows from, let's say, this block to this block, and this block is executing in software, this block is executing on a different context, we know from the platform how we need to move the data between these two blocks. So the user actually does not need to specify any device driver or any other uh, form of transport, um, except for just creating a line between these two blocks. So we have abstracted out the complete complexity of device drivers as well as you know, high performance transport between these two blocks, between these components. Um, of course, we don't have a complete, uh, what are the components that we support in our tool? I mean, there's a limited set of components, of course, that we support. We don't support all components, as well as the transport between them, right? We only support a certain set of uh, transports and uh, components. So the next slide kind of talks about the components and the um, transports that we support. So some, we, between two CPUs, for example, you can have uh, ARM, I'm sorry, an ARM CPU and an x86 CPU. We, you can connect it over Ethernet and tell us that the transport is going to be Ethernet. Um, the FPGA part, you, you can say we support uh, PCIe links or AXI links. So if the CPU and the FPGA are on the same chip, we will support AXI. If they are connected via an external transport like PCIe, we will support PCIe. Again, between CPU and FPGA, we will support PCIe. Between two FPGAs, we support an Aurora link. Aurora links are really SERDES based, uh, very high performance, high uh, bandwidth connections. Um, and between AI engines, again, I keep coming back to the AI engines. The AI engines are a collection of 400 um, small microprocessors that are put together on an array, VLIW, SIMD processors that are put in an array. Um, and we can communicate the data between the FPGA and the AI engines via AXI streams. So the next uh, slide kind of talks a little bit more about uh, how our workflow works. Um, so the user comes in and says, okay, uh, describe the hardware platform itself, right? What, what is the bottom layer looking like? Does it have an FPGA? It has two, let's say it has a, a FPGA and a x86 processor, um, and they are connected over PCIe. And then they, once they are defined the platform, uh, they say compile platform and we create some meta information. Uh, and then they develop that application on a canvas uh, based on that platform. So by placing different blocks on different components, they can specify what is executing where. And then they say compile generate system, in which case we will, for the FPGA portions, we will generate FPGA projects. Uh, for the AI engines, we will provide AI engine projects. Uh, the software, we will create software projects, as well as all the runtime and the device drivers that are required to transfer the data between them. Uh, so how does that work? When you say compile generate system, we create a C++ representation of the complete system. Uh, so these blocks that come in uh, and the IOs for each of these blocks are described in this C++ uh, format. And our system compiler, again, this is the first compiler that we have in the system. It actually reads C, C++, and creates an internal representation of the complete system. And from there, we use Python or Jinja2 platform uh, rendering to create projects for different uh, hardware or AIE or GNU make. So depending on the uh, type of uh, context or the type of component that you're generating code for, we use different templates. So the internal representation remains the same. We just change the template to generate different code. So with this concept, it's very easy for us to actually add different kinds of components. So if we, another new component came in, um, let's say a special type of DSP, we should be able to add another template and, uh, and create projects for that DSP.
So now we are going a little bit more into the programming of the AI engines, which are, like I said, it's a 400-core AI, 400 AI engine. Um, uh, uh, vector processing um, array that is present in the Xilinx FPGAs. Um, so currently the way the programming works without our tool is that the user has to pro create each of these blocks using a very um, low level um, assembly like programming uh, in, uh, to get to access the, um, the vector and the SIMD portions. Uh, what we've come up with, our, our company, is that we've come up with a, a C, C++ auto vectorizer. So this is one of the portions of the company that is actually going to be developed here in Armenia in Yerevan. So what that does is it takes C, C++ code, vectorizes it, and generates code for the AI engine. So now the user really needs to, really can program these small AI engine or, or these vector engines in C. And uh, this is getting a lot of traction from, from the users because um, while these processors are very capable, um, they are running at a gigahertz, but it's supremely difficult to program them. But with the auto vectorizer, they can actually program them in C. So this is kind of giving you an idea of how, what the auto vectorizer does. Uh, if you didn't have the auto vectorizer, you would actually have to program it in, in kind of a low level vector uh, language like this, right? So this is, although it looks like C, you can see that all the actual work is done by these, you know, uh, intrinsics, which you have to um, insert into your code. You have to first understand these intrinsics and program these intrinsics uh, into the uh, source code for you to be able to access the vector engine. But for, with our vectorizer, um, you can actually put C, C++ code and we will generate this, um, this vectorized code. So it is really a source-to-source -source transformation um, which takes, you know, from we use Clang to vector, uh, Clang and then LLVM to vectorize it. And then we have our own backend that actually converts the vectorized LLVM IR into the uh, AI engine intrinsics, which is like, like, like this. Again, this is, uh, all right, so we'll be able to identify and uh, help the vectorizer. Uh, when the user gives us some code, we'll be able to analyze that code and tell the user which parts are vectorizable and which parts are not vectorizable. And give him an idea of how we can, uh, um, he can modify the code to make it easy, easier to vectorize and easier to fit into the AI engines. So this is another project that we've just started. Again, a compiler-based project. The next thing I'm going to talk about is verification, right? So when you create a system or whenever you write a program, the first time it almost never works, right? Then you have to debug it. So in complex systems where it spans across the, uh, you know, when a CPU, uh, when a design is going from the FPGA to the CPU to some accelerator and back again, and data is flowing from, from the CPU to the FPGA to the accelerator and back, it becomes super very difficult to know what is happening or what, what is failing, right? So we provide you with a co-simulation um, environment. So if you check in a box and say, okay, I want to co-simulate, so we will create a design that will run the CPU on a QMU, the RTL on the FPGA, and the accelerator on any custom simulator that they have. So you can actually go very deep into each one of these components to figure out uh, what is actually going wrong, right? Um, one of the problems we faced with this custom accelerator is that, you know, it's a system C model, so it runs really slow, and it also requires a huge amount of memory. So we've actually come up with an idea of um, creating a fast cycle approximate simulation model. So essentially, we, have, we provide you with two different flavors of co-simulation. One is more cycle accurate or cycle approximate, where you can get the RTL to be in the RTL simulator, the CPU in the QMU, and the AI engine in the system C model. And the system C model is um, cycle accurate. 
or you can actually go down to uh, to the next one where it's the behavioral simulation where the AI engine is actually simulated on an instruction set architecture where which runs a um, whole lot faster than the system C model. And also we can say the x86 or the CPU no longer runs on the QMU model which is slower except that it runs natively on x86. And then we have some DPI interface between the RTL simulator and both of these x86 and the AIE simulation. Now we go into the, um, the next problem that people face in system programming, right? Once you have the system defined, you have the blocks, you've created the kernels and they have, you've debugged them and they are working. The next is how do, in a high performance system, how do I move the data between these blocks and not just between these blocks, from memory to these blocks or from any external uh, data generating SERDs, for example, um, sensors, the data that are coming from sensors uh, to, to, this, to these, uh, you know, 400 AI engines that are there. So in that case, we have actually come up with a, with a programmable uh, data mover. We can program the data mover to move the data either from on-chip or uh, on-chip memory to these um, processors, or you can move it from DDR to all these processors, right? And we'll go, we, uh, we've been working with a, a lot of users to figure out uh, what are these um, data movement paradigms that they use, right? What, it's, um, it is almost impossible to create a complete um, data movement solution. So what we focused on is with the users to tell us what are the possible data movement scenarios? What are the schemes, right? So the first scheme that we saw was the data was coming in from, from the DDR into small, uh, small chunks that are being distributed into the AI engine or different interfaces across horizontal, uh, vertically. So you get, you read small chunks of memory and distribute it to each one of them. So our RDMA program, like I said, the RDMA is programmable. The RDMA program is right here to do that, right? So you read 4K chunks, and send it to this address. The next scenario that we came up with, uh, that the users told us about, was that you get a very large chunk of data from the DDR, because DDRs are most efficient when you are actually reading very large chunks of data from them. You read large chunks of data from the DDR, and then sort of stripe it across vertically into each one of these um, AI uh, interfaces. So, yeah, and the striping can be, uh, depending on how your data is laid out in memory, the striping can be very different for each one of these interfaces. So you might send, you know, the first four bytes here, the third, next four bytes here, the third, then here, then here. So our, this RDMA can be programmed to actually uh, split the data or stripe the data across multiple interfaces. The third scenario that we came up, that the user told us about was when you get a very wide set of data, like this is your reading again, 512 data, and then you take the entire 512 data and send it simultaneously to all the interfaces. So this is especially uh, relevant for uh, radar processing where you can, when you have very large amounts of data coming in from the radar and being sent into processing elements uh, in, in the, either the FPGA or in, uh, in processors, right? And the fourth one is perhaps the most complex where you have, while you're transferring the data, you want to do some uh, manipulation of the data. For example, you know, you want to row, do a row column transformation while you're moving the data from, from the DDR into the interfaces. So our RDMA actually supports all of that, right? And these operate, uh, the RDMAs actually operate uh, completely independently by themselves without software intervention. So they can actually talk to each other and uh, perform and kind of coordinate the data movement between each other.
Now, so far what you've seen, um, you know, the user has to um, create all these blocks themselves and instantiate them and program them. So it is a very uh, cumbersome process to understand each one of these blocks and program those blocks and configure those blocks just for data movement, right? So with some DARPA funding, we are coming up with a Python-based solution where the user will be able to specify the platform and the context in, uh, in the top left. Then they define what are the memory interfaces they have, what are the DDRs they have in their system. And then they can kind of logical, create logical arrays or partitions and define arrays in those memories. So now instead of creating, uh, you're creating logical partitions inside the memory using Python. And then you can define your uh, kernels, right? You can say this is a kernel that has uh, in two inputs, one output and uh, some FIFO size between, between them. Then you can actually create the application by just connecting up those arrays, those logical arrays to the input blocks. And in that case, we will actually infer or create these, infer and program these our DMAs completely by themselves, right? Um, so instead of, so the user doesn't really uh, have to create any of these blocks anymore. They just specify them in Python and we create a system that is actually executing across multiple domains, right? So this part is, the top left is executing uh, on the CPU, this is executing on the FPGA, and this is actually executing on the AI engines. So we've created a complete system with very terse or very small amount of input. So in conclusion, we've covered you know, device driver generation. We've actually covered how we can program everything in C, and we've covered how we can um, simulate or uh, debug your application. And then we have come to the conclusion that we can actually generate this complete application with just a few lines of Python. With that, I'm going to end it. If you have any questions. We are going to have a separate q and session, so let's leave the questions for later. Thank you very much. Uh, let me speak to Armenian. Uh,